Yeah, welcome uh, to my video channel, Questions of Doubt in Corporate Valuation. My name is Bernhard Schwetzler, and our today's question of doubt is, does the holding period of the investor have an impact on corporate valuation or on corporate value? Yeah. So we start with the uh, with standard assumption in DCF um, corporate value calculation. The standard assumption is that the lifetime of the firm to be valued is infinite. Yeah? And we know that this is creating well-known problems, especially when calculating the so-called terminal value. And we also know that this is not very realistic for two particular reasons. The first one is firms do not have an infinite lifetime because they may go bankrupt. Uh, and the second reason for firms to cease to exist is that firms may get bought by another firm and merged with it. And also by doing so, of course, uh, the lifetime of the firm is going to be ended by this. Yeah? Both questions are not our topics today. Uh, we will go uh, into the bankruptcy topic in one of the next videos. Um, but our topic today is, it is also obvious that the current owners, uh, simply for physical reasons, may not and cannot stay infinitely the owners of the firm. Yeah, So they will not be able to receive all these cash flows over an infinite lifetime. Yeah? And that means that their holding period is going to differ from the lifetime of the firm. And that, of course, is then our today's topic. Is this going to impose a particular problem uh, for our valuation? Yeah? A good example is, by nature, private equity funds have a limited lifetime usually, and that means that they know now already when buying a firm that they only will have a limited holding period and they will be forced by their nature, by the limited lifetime of the fund, to exit their investment uh, and uh, sell the company. So their holding period is definitely significantly lower than the one of the firm. And the question now is, does this um, difference between the holding period and the lifetime somehow have to be taken into account when calculating the value of this company? Yeah. So the standard answer to this uh, under DCF assumptions is no. Yeah. The holding period is under certain circumstances and certain assumptions irrelevant for corporate valuation. So if we start and do standard DCF valuation, then the value of the company is usually the present value of all future cash flows over the infinite lifetime of the firm. So it is a present value of an infinite cash flow stream. Yeah? So now let's look at what happens if the current owner wants to sell at some point T, that is of course uh, earlier than infinity. Then the question is of course for his calculus when he is going to value or she is going to value the company what will be the exit price that she will get for the firm then, yeah? And the answer under this DCF valuation is quite simple. The idea is that if you sell the company, for instance, in our example here in 2022, then the price that you will get by selling it in 2022 is simply the present value of the free cash flows after 2022, that is from 2023 to infinity. Yeah? So you see that simple example in the table below of the slide. Here we have uh, an example where we have cash flows that grow at a decreasing rate, starting from 8% and then 7.2%. So the decline in the growth rate is 10% percentage point every period. And these are the corresponding cash flows. And you see that in the bottom line of this table that we have been calculating the present value using the rollback procedure. That is, in every period, we also always calculated the present value by the present value of the preceding period plus the cash flow of the preceding period discounted down over one period. Yeah? And so you can easily see when looking at these figures, if we sell our company in 2023 and we achieve an exit price of 2008 148.6 then, which is the present value from for the cash flows from 2024 to infinity, then obviously the result doesn't matter on whether we either receive the 22,848.6 as an exit price 
or whether we keep the company and by doing so, of course, get the present value of the outstanding cash flows, which is, of course, the same. Yeah? And that yields the result that if the assumption holds that if we sell the company, we will always receive the present value of the still outstanding expected cash flows, then the holding period is indeed irrelevant for the valuation of the company. Yeah? So, but now let's look at some particular arguments that might yield the result that uh, there is an impact of the holding period on the value of the corporation. Yeah? For instance, there are quite many cases that may come to mind where the current owner is the best owner for the firm only for a limited time. And then after this time has passed, then of course another owner steps in that is better able to run the company. Yeah? So that's a, a particular case in venture capital investments in the venture capital area, because here of course the venture capital fund is the best owner to help the firm to grow to a certain level or to a certain size. And then if this is reached, then of course um, other owners are better equipped than uh, to run and support the companies. Yeah? So as I said, maybe after some years, another better owner is then uh, achieving higher cash flows than me as the current owner and thus uh, might be able to pay a higher price. And the question is then, shall I be allowed to take this potential higher price into account and replace my cash flow estimates that I have beyond my optimal ownership phase um, by a higher exit price that someone else who is able to bet better able to run the firm is going to price. Yeah? So I simply might add a premium on top of my estimated present value or on the cash flows that follow my holding period. Yeah? And the thing is that that's my personal view on this. Of course, you don't have to share this, uh, but I just want to, uh, in that sense, highlight what I think about this. I do not think that this is uh, should be allowed in your own calculation. Yeah? I think that the firm should be valued by the current owners and by the current owner's ability to run it and thus based on his or her free cash flows estimates that she or he is able to achieve. Yeah? So otherwise, I think you would, uh, in that sense, allow to increase the value of your company based on, in that sense, the plain belief that later someone else might show up and buy it at a higher price from you. Yeah? So in that sense, I personally would still stick to the basic idea that it's your estimates for the cash flows that is relevant for the valuation of the firm. Yeah? So still, we have the result that we do not have any impact of the holding period on the firm's value that our earlier result is still going to hold. Yeah? So another impact factor that may come to mind are transaction costs. Yeah? That is, um, of course, when selling a company, then significant transaction costs may arise. Yeah? So you may have to pay fees for lawyers, advisors, for banks supporting you. And these costs are empirical estimates, but these costs may become significant. They may add, add up to five or even 8% on the transaction volume, uh, depending also, of course, on the size and the legal position of the firm. But in any case, they may become significant. Yeah? And so if you include these costs at the projected exit date, that is where you think somebody else should step in and take over these additional transaction costs, of course, reduce the free cash flow and the exit proceeds. Yeah? And now, of course, it's easy to see that uh, the holding period becomes relevant yeah? because, I mean, as the transaction costs kick in as a negative cash flow, of course, postponing uh, the exit for one period decreases the present value of these, of these costs because they are far away. Yeah? So we get the result then that of course the, the value of the firm is the higher, the longer the holding period is because the lower this present value of this additional costs are going to be. Yeah? So that would be one side effect where the holding period might become relevant for the valuation of your company as you have 
uh, only a limited holding period. So finally, um, I would like to highlight an example um, that uh, tries to tackle the question, why not optimize the holding period by choosing the holding period that maximizes the IR? Why did I pick this example? Well, um, you know that um, in every finance textbooks, uh, people are discouraged from using IR. Despite this fact, uh, IRR is still a quite popular criterion in the private equity industry. And as we have seen before, the private equity funds usually have a limited holding period by nature, by the construction uh, of their funds. Yeah? So the question is then, um, is there any difference when we optimize the holding period based on the IRR by maximizing it or by maximizing the net present value, including transaction costs? Yeah? So we ext have extended our simple example from above by introducing a 5% transaction costs uh, that kick in at the given exit point, so at the end of the holding period. And we do now the following thing. We first calculate the, the net present value based on the DCF valuation on the exit value and, of course, including the 5% transaction costs. So you see that uh, we said that um, the current investment to buy the asset or to buy the firm is 1,500. And then you see if we exit after one period, we get here a value after one period of um, 2,556.9, including the 5% transaction costs on the value of it. And you see here in the next period, we have two times um, of cash flows 108 and then when we exit we get a net proceed of 2650 and so on yeah so you see here the different holding periods and you look here into the red colored column you see then of course uh, the result that we already have been deriving uh, in the preceding slide that our net present value is increasing with increasing holding period and the reason is quite simple of course, the far away these 5% transaction costs are, the lower is their present value contribution and the higher the net present value becomes. Yeah? So now looking at the IRR, so you see here for each and every of these payment streams, of course, uh, for, for the different holding periods, we calculate the IRR. And you see now here in the yellow column, um, colored column, you see that uh, the IRR is declining at increasing holding periods. Yeah, in the first year, we have an IRR of 70.5%, then it declines to 36, and then it goes down to 17.95. Yeah? So you see that uh, relying on IRR when optimizing uh, the holding period is, of course, yielding the opposite result than relying on NPV when optimizing the holding period. Yeah? And of course, um, again, that relates to uh, any introductory ch chapter of a finance textbook. That's just yet another pitfall uh, of relying on IRR. Yeah? So IRR is also giving us, in that sense, flawed answers. What is the optimal holding period uh, of an investment when we introduce transaction costs? Yeah? Of course, at the end, uh, and, and, and just to help out um, and find some arguments in favor for the private equity industry, there are, of course, other criteria that may come into play um, when uh, a private equity fund is going to optimize the holding period, uh, not just looking at the plain and simple IRR. Okay, so that's it for today. Thank you.